realized that all right so whenever we first officially met in Atlanta obviously you know it was, it was all that but I had forgotten that I had actually liked your Twitter like on the first back in 2013 when I started because I think that was whenever you were doing the news and so whenever I had gone back to look at it I was like oh I already got her oh <laughs> right she was, doing <laughs> she was doing this already so I was like oh okay now this Makes a lot more sense. I don't know why I didn't recognize, but of course, I yeah, it's, it's not just happened like that shit. Man. Yeah, all good. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, no, but, you know, really, you know, I, I, I typically want to start from the beginning, but actually, let me, let me take, I'm going to do it a little different. Let me start from the middle, all right? Okay. When you, when you first started on to, no, no, once you got off the women's national teams, all right, you know, what was it about media that got you situated and started finding your way kind of back, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I Okay, can you... <laughs> okay, so... All right. Yes, let's so, a little bit more. Because I think, so, I was... I was on a team for 15s and 7s. Uh, well, 7s up until 2013, and then 15s until 2014. And then sort of did, uh, yeah, took some time off and then came back in 15 with Columbia, 16. So, so I guess period. whenever you started getting really active on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, what, cause the, the positioning of how you did your posts were, it was, it was, it was insider, but it wasn't like what you found with a lot of other sources. It wasn't in a traditional, it, a lot of people while, while they are digital, they kind of still emphasize in almost a traditional media kind of way, but you mm. were one of the few people that were just trying to push a social media aspect. And it mm -hmm. wasn't something that, like, you know, now you see Mike Fridays and Richie Walkers and Dan Payne and all those people now active on Twitter. But prior to that point, there wasn't really players or anybody on, on Twitter. They weren't really active on Facebook. Mm -hmm. What attracted you to being that kind of player? Uh, to, to be able to yeah so I think for me it was uh, being a female athlete the exposure and the recognition was always uh, smaller than than you know my, my male counterparts so uh, you know for most of my career I was told if you perform the money will follow and and it never actually materialized that way. You know, I think, you know, we finished third at the World Cup for sevens. We finished fifth in 2010. And uh, we were performing. Um, but the money never really kind of uh, followed <laughs> that promise. And so for me, I was like, okay, well, social media has the power to connect people to a fan base that might not otherwise know about you or care about you. And... On, on women's teams, we're always tasked with fundraising. It's like, it's, it's just a, a terrible experience, but it's a necessary one. We don't have the same funding, we don't have the same resources, we don't have the same um, alumni networks. So for me, when I started playing uh, fifth, uh, sevens at Chua Vista, I was like, we need for people to know about our team because we're talented, we're gonna, we're gonna achieve, um, we know we're, we're a fun group of women. I think people knowing us better will get emotionally invested in us and will eventually want to help us. So that was the idea, uh, the initial idea. And I was like, okay, what, what do people want to see? Like, you know, USA Rugby is already posting about, oh, the U.S. team is going to be in this area or they're going to be competing in this tournament. But what do they care about? Like, they care about the players. If they can start caring about, um, you know, what Vicks, like Victoria Felion is doing on the side or Jill Potter or Christy Ringenberg, if they can see that, like, Christy has a family life, but she's also dedicating her, her professional life to being the best athlete she can be. Like, will they care? Will they want to support us? And that was sort of the idea behind that. So I think I saw early on the power that Twitter could have connecting us who were unknown athletes, but with a lot of potential to people in the rugby world across the world that might care about our mission and our vision and might want to, to support us. Um, so that was the initial idea, yeah. <laughs> no, and I think that makes sense because I, especially I guess, I guess 
whenever Twitter really kind of started to make its takeoff around 2011, 2012. And you, you start to create this humanization. Like, it had been always so long that when you're dealing with athletes or celebrities, it's there's a mystique to them, you know? Yeah. And so you, you because there's that mystique, it's easier to treat somebody like an object as opposed to like an actual... Um, an actual entity, an actual person, a human being. Mm -hmm. So to be able to say, to create that relation is is important and, and does create an, a different awareness where they're not just those people that, oh, you messed up on the field this or you just did that. Now they're like, oh, you are you got a name and you have mm -hmm. a background and you're outside of the box of yeah. just the field, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's very true. And I think I th that's what a lot of people like, I mean, uh, I'm really goofy and, and love to, to do like silly videos, but those were the things that people enjoyed seeing the most. And luckily for me, I was near uh, Bowie and Victoria who are also goofballs and like we would create these ridiculous videos, but that's what people enjoyed and they were like, oh, so you're training hard, uh, but you also have like these personalities that we don't necessarily get to see because you're only presented within the scope of uh, or within the lens of, of rugby, right? What was really interesting to me, too, though, was that um, even though rugby, and especially women's rugby, is still something that's a very small base in the U.S. and it's fairly unknown, uh, we still get back, we also get backlash for that. So, you know, uh, a lot of us moved to Chula Vista, uh, took pay cuts, quit our jobs, moved away from our families, and basically we're in this, like, mi mini microcosm, just like rugby all the time. Uh, we were paid, you know, I think like at poverty level. So like not a lot of opportunities to, to do a lot of other stuff. So you kind of get, you, you have to get creative, right? So we would hang out together all the time. And I was like, let's make a video about cookies or, you know, something dumb. And then we would get comments on the videos like, wow, glad to see that that's what you're spending your professional athlete money on. And I'm like, um, first of all, <laughs> do you know how much we make? Right. <laughs> because you would not be talking about our salary. <laughs> Secondly, it's a Friday night at 9 p.m., <laughs> which means I'm not out drinking and, and I'm with my friends. Like, this is not my training time. And it was really interesting to see that, you know, added exposure came with benefits. But no matter how small you are, you still get some of, like, the trolls and, like, the haters and stuff like that. So it was, it was a very interesting uh, experience, to say the least. But uh, most of the time, I, th I think people were really positive. And it did, you know, we started the U.S., um, the, the handles for the, the women's programs and, and it, it's been growing steadily and so it's good to see that um, people are recognizing the efforts that female athletes are putting into their, their sports and, and, and they're becoming more sort of, uh, yeah, emotionally involved with it and, and then hopefully financially involved with it with a little bit of support. <laughs> you know, I, I think honestly, it, it's one of those things that it, it, it you're like you said, it, it's systemic because for those very actions that you, you guys were doing back in 2013, 2012, these are the things that people now look forward to. And for what it's worth, you almost feel like there's a lack of it because mm -hmm. now you don't have it. I, I remember whenever the, the pro rugby league started and, you know, you have your five teams last year and then you're seeing them and they're doing blah, blah, blah. But there was only one team that I thought was just like absolutely dope. And it was San Diego, Char whatever they call themselves, the San Di whatever the San Diego team was. And the thing that made them stand out was that they were the only ones that I felt were consistently putting out videos that just looked like they were having a good time. Mm -hmm. Like, they looked like they were working. They looked, you, you saw the roster, you're like, ah, oh, these guys are talented. You know, they, they got some skills. But they look so awesome just working hard. And so mm -hmm. there was a, an intrinsic need to, you know, there, for me, there was an intrinsic uh, attraction to watching them play or at least rooting for them. Even though I had friends in other places, and technically I would have been rooting for Ohio, but I was just <laughs> like, no, these guys are awesome. Like, these are superstars here. Everybody else is, eh, yeah, you know, they're cool, they're, they're playing. But these guys, I, they're, they're going to be something. They had Cam Newton out there, and, you know, they're working with the Chula Vista people a little bit and stuff. So it, it has that, and it was based off of those videos and stuff like that. So it's it's awesome that you guys had that set up in, in, in advance. And... I look at that as the well with with women's rugby. So after let's after the Olympics, I, I think that was one of the greatest uh, showcases of women's rugby that you could ever ask for, because it was the first time that I think that people would be able to see that 
Uh, and, and, you know, I'd seen it at, in Atlanta, so none of it surprised me. But I think it was, the, for, for most people, it was the first time you could be like, yo, these these people are kind of serious. Like, yeah. do you see these hits? Like, this this isn't a joke. <laughs> yeah, and I think, uh, so I, I think the Olympics really helped with that. First of all, at the Olympics, every athlete was provided a Samsung so a phone, like a Seven Edge, yeah, Samsung Galaxy S7 Edge or something like that. It's too many no blows, things. But right? anyways, it was no an blow. amazing phone. Like The media on it is insane. And uh, and then you were given a SIM card and unlimited uh, data access for the month of August. So I, th I think that was genius uh, on the Olympics uh, part because media is becoming an increasing, um, like increasingly becoming an integral part of how athletes are connecting with their fans and, and just creating sort of their own brand, right? And I think having an athlete with an individual brand can only help not only the club, but also the sport overall. So they did a phenomenal job of that. And so it, it almost was a bit detrimental sometimes because you were constantly like in the locker room before the game, you know, I mean, not, we weren't that crazy because before game time, you're, you are focused on what you're doing, right? Like, or, Hopefully you are. <laughs> it's a different different conversation, but that was really fun. I think like people appreciated that they could see what the athletes were doing in preparation for the tournament, after the tournament, and things like that. And some some players are doing a really great job of using that momentum they built at the Olympics, and continuing to post um, media that people are interested in. You know, I'm seeing like uh, some of the Australian girls, some of the uh, uh, New Zealand girls, some of the U.S. girls have grown in their following like some people have like tens of thousands of fans now they post something they immediately they get like a thousand likes a thousand views things that a year or two ago you know was completely unheard of uh so i think you know rugby was actually one of the best welcome sports at the olympics people really enjoyed it people didn't know about rugby sevens that much globally uh, but once they saw it they were like oh this is amazing a lot of people appreciate that there are no differences between men and women's rugby. They are seeing women like hitting each other just like the men are, you know, um, being so physical and being so athletic. And it's really good to see that that's translating into uh, bigger followings for these women and, and, and better opportunities because now you're seeing like sponsors getting involved and, um, you know, they, they're becoming sort of like what women's soccer was in like the 80s and 90s. It's becoming that for them. Like they're paving the way for younger girls. Uh, they're establishing a, a new form of athlete. You know, we're, we're seeing like the Serena, Serena Williams of the world, like big muscular women. And now we're seeing rugby players sort of also uh, infiltrating that space of like really muscular women um, expressing their athleticism in, in new ways. So I think it's awesome. Um, one thing that I find uh, that kind of differentiates the people that are, like you said earlier, like su successful versus the ones that are sort of like lagging is the ones that are successful are pretty, pretty organic with what they post. It's just like, this is what I'm doing. This is maybe how it's helping my training. Uh, this is my life. Welcome to it. You're welcome to follow. If you don't care, don't follow that type of thing. I'm finding that a lot of athletes now are doing a lot of posts that are like, thanks to so-and-so for sending free samples and it just feels very contrived, you know? Yeah. And so there's sort of this fine balance of like trying to find your identity on social media still. Like um, how do you present yourself in a way that you're still able to be yourself without having to always relate that to uh, like another person or something like that, if that makes sense. 